I'm your cult boyfriend. I'm currently watching Gilmore Girls for the first time, and I'm on season two. I just watched episode nine of the second season, Runaway Little Boy. And it was one of the most fascinating episodes of TV that I've ever seen. A Gilmore Girls analysis. Let's do a little bit of a character study. Let's talk about Amy Sherman Palladino. Let's talk about Gilmore Girls. And by God, please, let's talk about Chad Michael Murray, who, if you watch this channel normally, you'll know that I'm a pretty big fan of Chad Michael Murray. I love his work on One Tree Hill, and I love him on Dawson's Creek. And you better believe that I love his work on Gilmore Girls. What makes Tristan Dugray such a fascinating character is that he wasn't allowed to be. He, Chad Michael Murray, left the show to go work on Dawson's Creek as Charlie Todd. And then he went on to, of course, play Lucas Scott in One Tree Hill, and the rest is history. He was a prominent fixture in the first season as a budding rival to Dean for Rory's affections. He was definitely a suitor. He was definitely a gentleman caller. He was certainly a prospect. One of Rory's doting, hopeful, affectionate suitors. And in the first season, he's primarily a jerk, but there is a deep amount of tenderness and affection that doesn't necessarily allow itself to surface because Tristan is also a pretty defensive character. I, I wouldn't necessarily call him insecure until the episode that I just watched. In season one, he's very defensive, and these emotions that he's feeling, he, he's very uncomfortable with them, and his knee-jerk reaction to them is a toxic one. Uh, but Tristan, due to Chad Michael Murray's performance and Amy Sherman Palladino and the other writers, their um, characterization. Tristan doesn't feel like a complete jerk in the first season. There is that affectionate core, and there's that natural charisma, there's that true charm, and there's something better than that. Unlike One Tree Hill or Dawson's Creek, Gilmore Girls is a show that adores every single one of its characters. Gilmore Girls loves every single character that I've seen in it so far. It cherishes them. And it definitely, definitely adored and cherished Tristan Dugray. Now, Tristan Dugray is a character who I think certainly had a lot of narrative potential and I'm sure was the key element in a lot of narrative plans and romantic entanglements. And perhaps he was even the one who was supposed to end up with Rory. I wouldn't be surprised because I felt such a huge, like, kinetic, passionate um, charge that this electric energy between Chad Michael Murray and Alexis Bledel between Tristan and Rory a great amount of energy, a great amount of chemistry between them um, in, in a romantic kind of uh, framework. I wouldn't be surprised if Tristan was originally developed, was developing, you know, into um, the true, um, the, the, the true one for Rory. I believe that that certainly was an option. But TV is a weird thing. TV is an, an, uh, a beautiful form of art, and it's almost beautiful on account of so many of the hurdles, so many of the problems that television shows have to face that are unique to television. You know, I do love TV because we have these long form narratives. We have um, very impressive, immersive and extremely sophisticated uh, structures through the episodes. We have incredible archetypes. We have deconstructions. We have um, Basically, everything with 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 uh, like everything cinematic, I believe, is done best through television right now, um, and definitely at this in the early two thousands when this show was first being produced. But television also has a lot of unique problems. You have to recast. Uh, actors just get pulled. Studio notes come in that you must follow immediately, and they could completely compromise whatever sort of um, sincerity you're striving for within your show. Actors decide to leave. It just happens. And there are cases, plenty of cases, where characters are written off of shows. 
Some are more dignified than others. But none has been done to this stirring postmodern effect as Tristan Dugray being written out of um, Gilmore Girls. Because as I've said, Gilmore Girls loves its characters. Gilmore Girls loved Tristan Dugray. So how does Gilmore Girls write Tristan Dugray out of the show? A character that they had so much potential for, that, they, that, that the character that they knew had so much potential, a character that they had so many plans for. And Tristan has this archetype. If this is a screwball comedy, within the frameworks of a screwball comedy, screwball comedies are almost romantically engaging with the meta narratives of romance itself by turning the traditional romantic story on its head while still uh, fulfilling the requirements of um, romantic energy. Sex, uh, sex comedy without the sex, I believe, is the popular way of describing screwball comedies. Well, Tristan and Rory is t true love without the truthfulness, or true love without the love you pick. It's the relationship without the relationship. It's Romeo and Juliet without Romeo. Gilmore Girls itself is both a deconstruction and a celebration of the screwball comedy in a 22-episode format of television um, focused on coming of age, focused on the idea of, of doubles, of a mother and a daughter. Yes, whatever. Let's forget all about that right now. Chilton itself is this private school that has a lot of elements inversed about it. Every kid who goes to this private school is, is almost cri cripplingly insecure. But Tristan Dugray is kind of unique in this, whereas Paris Geller, who is my favorite character, definitely wears her insecurities on her sleeve, and she's driven, and she has incredible goals and ambitions. They are ambitions within a certain kind of framework that's not interested in the meta narrative. Tristan, in episode 9 of season 2, he seems so upset. So upset because there's like a fatalistic energy, there, there, there's a preordained quality to Tristan's inclusion in this episode. Because we didn't actually have to see him. We could have just not mentioned him. This was episode 9, after all. But he hadn't seen him since uh, the finale of season 1. He seems so upset and aggravated by the fact that he is going to be an unfulfilled archetype, that he was a deconstruction who, who, who never even got to act as a wrecking ball in any situation. So in, in episode 9, he's going to do his darndest everything that he possibly fucking can to crush, to deconstruct, to fulfill the requirements of his archetype as fast as he can, as um, grotesquely as he can, you know? Um, violent faux pas and delusions of grandeur. Tristan will transcend his archetype because that's what postmodern brats do. And I think he's acting like a postmodern brat because this is a character, um, this is a an archetype, a, a trope even, given a certain kind of autonomy to, to reason with the fact that, oh, I am not going to be able to fulfill any one of my uh, narrative beats. I'm not going to reach any one of those stages. And I deserved it, didn't I? I'm the hottest guy here. I had so much room to change. I, I, I kissed Rory at the party. I, 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 I go to Chilton. I have a heart. You saw my affection. You saw my sensitivities, even if they were morbid, even if they were still callous. You saw that I was Romeo. You saw that I had the ability but now I've been crippled. I've been crippled by th the idea of making popular art itself. I I've been crippled because now my character will not get to fulfill any one of those basic requirements that, that a, a, a Romeo of a new sincerity desperately needs to occupy uh, and live through and transcend. In episode 9, he's involved in a project with Rory, with Paris, about Shakespeare, and they get, by chance, the death scene, which is so fitting because this is basically Tristan's death scene, and it's the death of something larger. I think it's the death of all of the possibilities that Tristan had for not only Gilmore Girls, but for Rory Gilmore as this kind of true character, as this true symbol of, um, 
of the screwball darling turned inside out to reach a new sincerity. Uh, it's perfect that he is playing out this death scene. And I mean, clearly, because this is his final episode, he's leaving now. So it's fitting that it's a death scene. And he is so sardonic about um, his involvement in this group project. You can tell that there's a lot of attraction that he still feels for Rory. And I feel um, an intense amount of eroticism still from the two of them in the scenes they share in the ninth episode. They talk about the kiss that they had at season two at that party after he broke up with Summer in front of the piano bench, which is still, I think, the most romantic moment I've seen on this show thus far. Or at least the most truthfully passionate one. Um, one that felt correct. Um with a certain like postmodern tool set it felt correct it felt within a wheelhouse that i was very interested in seeing explored but now of course we can't it could even be speaking larger if i could just say very quickly because tristan does come back in episode nine it's like a, um like a contrived kind of bad boy version of himself because maybe that's what happened to romeo in the early 2000s to to the rich and perfect and preppy looking romeo in, in the early in the early to mid 2000s um romeo was being given these darker edges by postmodernists who definitely don't understand nuance nor sophistication who don't understand the the the, the, the qualities that are eternal um, and shouldn't be deconstructed. So Tristan is having to, he, he's so aggravated and upset because um, his very archetype is being changed by immature adults who truly don't understand what the function of his archetype was to begin with. And for that, he has been cast out of the postmodern framework. That's always an idea, too, and that's certainly something that the show does meditate on and study. But I think what's fascinating, what's most fascinating about it is, I, I say postmodern brat, and I mean brat in every single way. In this episode, he tries to start fights with Dean. He, 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 he tries to reveal to Dean that, like, yo, I kissed this girl already, bro. I kissed her the day after you broke up with her. This, this would be our second kiss. Like, it's fascinating that he doesn't actually kiss her in this episode. That it's not contrived nor theatrical, because if he did kiss her, that would be within the dramatic setting, within a certain kind of dramaturgy, within a stage, front of Dean. It would have been theatrical, it would have been contrived. And the kiss that they had in season one was entirely pure, entirely true, and entirely spontaneous, which made it entirely meaningful. I think it's fascinating that it's his final episode and he doesn't kiss her, but he kind of dares Dean to watch. Because this is an archetype who is rebelling at the idea that his that he's being vanquished, that he has all of this potential, has all of this like inner um all of this interiority, all of this romantic interiority, all of this angst that has gone unexplored, and he's lashing out on everyone who will view him and maybe he doesn't kiss her because as an archetype he he has he's seeing the artifice of this situation the artifice of chilton the artifice of of the show itself the artifice of of archetypal expectations so he's not going to go along with this play and by the way they just get through the rehearsal it's like the show itself. The first season was a rehearsal. Everything that he had done in the 10 or 11 episodes that he appeared in previous were, uh, was a huge rehearsal to, to an actual um, um, romantic moment or, or a relationship with Rory. And he only got to be there for the rehearsal. And then when time came, when he was called up, he's not there. He can't go on. He's not allowed. He's literally being shipped off to North Carolina, which is where they shoot Dawson's Creek. Like, this is... I'm not stretching. Don't even accuse me of, of reaching here, because I'm not. He can't fulfill Romeo's obligations. He can be there in the rehearsal, and he still fucks the rehearsal up. He deliberately sabotages the rehearsal. And I find in that scene where he's telling Rory that he's going off to military school, they, they use that I call it an adorable framing because it it, it doesn't to, to, to minimize its power because it is very powerful. 
but it's normally always done within an adolescent juvenile and angsty setting, which makes me feel um, um, nostalgic, but also hopeful. You know, angsty and hopeful. So it's the hopeful symmetry, which is what I should truly call it, and I guess I will from now on. The hopeful symmetry, it mirrors it from the finale, but it's reversed. It's inverted, right? It's, it's, it's the symmetry that we, we weren't allowed to see because Tristan had to basically die for all intents and purposes. The archetype, the Romeo archetype, the well had been poisoned like in the play, and Romeo just sabotaged himself, self-destructed, like the suicide of the Romeo and Juliet play, and Tristan had to leave the show, Chad Michael Murray had to go to Dawson's Creek, that had to be over. So this symmetry is showing us what we could have gotten because it's inverted. And the season one finale, it's Chad Michael Murray who is in the center, in the distance, looking in, uninvolved, uninvited to um, to this kind of uh, romantic pairing uh, with Rory. Whereas in episode nine, it is Dean who is in the distance, watching on, uninvolved, shut out of a moment, a romantic moment and a mournful moment and a, a moment of loss, which, which are always romantic, in my opinion, between Rory and Tristan. Tristan's just so upset and he knows that he's being analyzed. I mean, he's, he tells Rory to stop analyzing him. He knows that he's being analyzed as an archetype because he's being presented within a, a postmodern teen drama context. And he's aggravated that even under analysis, he won't live up to any notion of a Romeo. So he self-destructs. So this archetype kills itself. This archetype kills himself. Tristan self-sabotages. And... I think he does it with a fair amount of brutal grace. He asks, do you no longer, like, do, do, do you have, like, do you no longer have any need for me? He asks her that. He asks Paris that. Do you no longer have any need for me? And he's aggravated. He's a character who's aggravated that his narrative has to be, like, crudely chopped bits right now. Gilmore Girls doesn't require him anymore. Romeo doesn't get justice in the new millennium. Romeo kills himself in every iteration. Take care of yourself, Mary. I just think it's so fascinating. And I, and I love characters that do this. Characters that seem to be at war with... Not even the writers, not even the, 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 the style of the piece, not even the piece itself, but the, the idea of narratives as a whole, the idea of cinematic or, or theatrical expectations that, that are kind of overwhelming. And then the character just refuses and goes, no. Or you get a situation like Tristan, who certainly had um, the know-how. He had, he had the skill, he had the capability to take those overwhelming expectations and meet them head-on. He could have transcended it all and been a, a true sort of um, millennial Romeo. And he wasn't allowed to. He couldn't. And so in the face of not being able, um, being refused, like he was forbidden to complete his arc. In the face of that, he decides to self-implode. He decides to self-destruct. He decides to uh, self-sabotage and get sent away forever from this narrative, never to be seen again, at least in the form of Chad Michael Murray, never to be seen. He would rather childishly rebel against the very parameters of character, of characterization, and of how pathetic all archetypes can be when driven into a corner. 
Uh, Tristan Dugray is one of the most fascinating characters I've ever engaged with, mostly because of Episode 9. Episode 9 is one of the best episodes of, of any show that I've ever seen. Gilmore Girls uh, really floored me with this. Um, Amy Sherman Palladino, the showrunner and creator and head writer, certainly, certainly fucking knew what she was doing here. Um, I, I said she was a genius in my Season 1 analysis video, and yeah. <laughs> she absolutely is, dude. Um, but her handling of, of Tristan, of Tristan's pointless rejection of Gilmore Girls, of the narrative, the pointless rejection of it all, I thought was such a beautiful thing. Tristan's beautiful ruins. The beautiful ruins of Tristan du Grey. I like that. I like the sound of that. The beautiful ruins of Tristan du Grey. That's what this character study was. That's what Gilmore Girls explored in in this particular episode. And through and through the arc that was refused of through the promise through the promised kiss that was never to truly be and Tristan got mad and Tristan revolted at the idea it repelled and repulsed him We need a certain kind of postmodern justice for the Romeo archetype. Because Tristan du Grey wasn't allowed to have it. But there's something even more beautiful about the beautiful ruins of Tristan du Grey. I think that it's more artistically relevant, resonant, and remarkable to see Tristan du Grey pointlessly and pathetically rebel against circumstance against narrative circumstance than to see him actually accomplish it. To see him accomplish his arc. The beautiful ruins of Tristan du Grey will always be the most beautiful thing. One of the most beautiful things in all of teen drama. I love you guys. Thank you for watching. Tonight, let's contemplate, let's study, let's Let's think about the beautiful ruins of Tristan du Grey. I've been your cult boyfriend. Next week, I'll have a full video analysis about season two. This episode was just too good. I had to devote an entire video just to it. And I think Tristan deserved it. After all. After all he went through. After all his kicking and screaming. I think I owed him this much. Thank you for watching.